I want to talk about distal left main bifurcation stenting. This talk complements my prior bifurcation talks, as well as my talk about LV support in complex PCI and left main stenting techniques. So I suggest you review those three talks. For each left main PCI, as I explained in that talk, there are five major questions and three additional questions. Need for atherectomy, left main bifurcation technique, LV support, sedation plan. And LV support is decided on two major features and six additional features. The two major features are hemodynamics, including blood pressure, LVEDP, and clinical heart failure and hypoxemia, and the complexity of your left main intervention, which you can modify depending on which stenting technique, distal bifurcation stenting technique you use. The three additional questions you ask are, if you have RCA stenosis, should I stent it first or after? Usually RCA stenting is done after left main PCI as an Excel trial, unless you have a critical large super dominant RCA with a stenosis over 90%, while the left main stenosis is relatively moderate. For downstream disease deemed necessary to treat, you may stent it before stenting left main, unless you have a critical osteo left main with guide ventricularization and ischemia, or unless you have ongoing left main ischemia as your wiring and advancing balloons. The third additional question is, is it difficult to wire left main and or proximal LAD and you have a critical 99% stenosis, so much so that flow is expected to shut down during wiring, in which case this may further favor LV support. And regarding bifurcation left main stenting, the same general approach applies. Most distal left main bifurcation should be treated with provisional stenting. And I'm talking about true left main bifurcation involving the osteum of the left circumflex. So you do crossover stenting into the LAD, then you rewire and balloon the left circumflex only if it is more than 75% narrow, then you stent it only if it remains narrow after ballooning, especially narrower than 75 to 90%. You want a higher threshold to stent that left circumflex than to balloon it. In EBC main trial, the side branch was stented only for a cutoff of 90% despite ballooning or for the presence of dissection. Also, proximal part of the main branch stent reduces side branch narrowing and the need for side branch post dilatation, according to EBC main analysis. And you only go for upfront two, two stent strategy in complex true bifurcation, where not only the main and side branch are involved, but the involvement is very complex, meaning the circumflex is more than 70% and it's a long disease, not just the osteum, but longer than 10 millimeter. And you have heavy calcium or heavy plaque burden in the main branch. The risk of side branch occlusion here after main vessel stenting is up to 20%. There are two major left main bifurcation trials you need to know, EBC main and DK crush five. EBC main took true distal left main bifurcation and randomized them to provisional stenting versus upfront two stent strategy. Those were true left main bifurcations, but not very complex. The side branch stenosis length was seven plus or minus six millimeters. And the baseline side branch stenosis was around 52 plus or minus 18%. Importantly, provisional stenting did as well, if not better than the two stent strategy. And in fact, at one year, the need for revascularization trended to be better in the provisional strategy. And at three years, the need for revascularization was actually better with provisional strategy. And in, there was a trend toward better MACE with a provisional strategy in a true distal left main bifurcation. 
And importantly, even in true left main bifurcation in that trial, only 22% of the provisional arm required dual stent, even though almost all of them received left circumflex dilatation, which tells you that dilating the side branch, which is a left circumflex in this case, does not mean it has to be stented. Even a large left circumflex, you frequently need to dilate it in a true bifurcation stenting, but you frequently do not need to stent it. So side branch post dilatation is frequently done in provisional true bifurcation using a 75% side branch cutoff as per the landmark bifurcation trials such as DK Crush 5 and EBC main. And stenting of the side branch is reserved for a 90% cutoff despite side branch ballooning or for side branch dissection. Now regarding predilatation of the side branch, this is more controversial. Side branch predilatation was done in 40 to 50% of the provisional arm in left main true bifurcation trials, such as the two major ones, EBC main and DK crush five. I perform side branch predilatation usually for side branch more than 70 to 80% stenotic or heavily calcified side branch in order to reduce side branch occlusion post main branch stent and to ensure that the lesion yields. However, systematic side branch predilatation may increase the risk of dissection of the side branch, which makes it more difficult to rewire that side branch. That is why in EBC main, side branch predilatation increases the risk of conversion to two stent because of side branch dissection. So you may predilate the side branch when it's critical, otherwise try to avoid it. So even in true left main bifurcation, you often don't need to stent the left circumflex even if you balloon it. Now even more in non-true left main bifurcation where the left circumflex is not involved, try to not even touch at all the side branch, which is usually the left circumflex. Wire it, but do not pre or post dilate it. There is no evidence that leaving a grid of metal thin struts stent across the left circumflex osseum is harmful. So you can just stent across and not even rewire and balloon. You can leave that grid of metal without opening it at the end of your procedure. This likely applies to non-true bifurcation that are mainly going to the circumflex where mainly your disease is left main and circumflex and the LAD is the practical non-diseased side branch. Even in that case, you can stand directly into left circumflex and not rewire and balloon the LAD unless it becomes severely narrow. So you can leave that grid of metal across it, although you do have a lower threshold to balloon or stand if your LAD is what you have considered a side branch. There is indirect evidence that even dilating the side branch in those non-true bifurcation cases is not beneficial and may worsen main branch outcome unless the side branch becomes occluded. Most of the data is from non-left main studies. You have the CROSS and Nordic 3 and the recent KISS trial, all those showing that in non-true bifurcation, do not touch the side branch unless it occludes. And there is also the COBIS-3 one-stent arm showed that kissing balloon leads to more target lesion revascularization of the main branch. In the left main arena, you have the left main XL sub-analysis showing that kissing balloon inflation no benefit in the one-stent strategy and there was a trend to more stent thrombosis. All this suggests that you should reserve left circumflex post dilatation for stenosis over 75 to 90%, even more so in the case of non-true bifurcation at baseline. Importantly, side branch post dilatation or KISS may be harmful in non-true bifurcation or non-complex bifurcation at baseline unless the side branch eventually occludes because that side branch dilatation or kiss may distort the main branch stent. Okay. 
That is why data from cross trial and from left main Excel analysis suggests possible harm from KISS in patients who undergo one stent strategy. This is a case from EuroPCR from Dr. Hildik Smith, who is the primary investigator of EBC main. He shows a case here where you have a trifurcation left main, but the main disease is distal left main into that OM. The LAD and the diagonal are not severely diseased. So he did a simplified approach here. He just stented from left main into that OM while just wiring the LAD. And he got a great result. And he did not need to rewire and balloon that LAD. So he just did provisional stenting into the OM1 and did not even rewire and balloon the grid across the LAD. Again, in favor of a very simplified strategy, particularly in non-true bifurcation, but even in true bifurcations that aren't very complex, where you don't have heavy disease burden and long disease on the side branch. Only DK crush five showed that in distal left main, two stent strategy may be better than a provisional strategy, but only in complex distal left main disease, where again, the, the circumflex is more than 70%, not just 50% stenose, and the disease is long, more than 10 millimeter, and you have heavy plaque and or calcium burden in that left main LED system. Now, the question I want to mainly address here, what two stent strategy to use, whether as upfront approach or when two stent are needed in the provisional approach. So in the upfront two stent strategy, you may choose one of the following four, DK crush, culotte, T and protrusion tap in a planned fashion as a two stent strategy, because this may be used also as a provisional strategy, but simplest and maybe best of all is the perfect T strategy, which is almost like a nano crush, as I will explain. So those are the four, and my preferred is perfect T. And second is tap. If provisional stenting is needed after main branch stent, and you haven't obtained a good result with just ballooning the side branch left circumflex, then you may choose reverse crush, which is similar to DK crush, but you're starting with main branch stenting rather than side branch stenting. You can do culotte technique, but simplest at, of all is the tap technique. So you have three options, but simplest is tap. With both planned culotte and tap, you may start by placing your first stent in the left main to the LAD, then you place your left circumflex stent in tap or culotte. Or you may start by placing your first stent from the left main to the left circumflex. Then you place your LAD stent, whether in tap or culotte. And in those cases, we would call them inverted tap and inverted culotte. Starting with stenting from the left main to left circumflex versus left main to LAD really depends on the severity of that left circumflex stenosis compared to the LAD stenosis and how likely it is to occlude that left circumflex if you start by putting a stent from the left main to the LAD and how difficult it will be to rewire the left circumflex once you put a stent from the left main to the LAD. In perfect T nano crush and in standard crush, single kiss or DK crush, you start by stenting whichever branch you assign as side branch, typically the left circumflex, and there is no risk of side branch or main branch loss at any time, unlike with tap and culotte. And that is an advantage of those techniques. No concern of branch occlusion in the middle of your procedure.
I will move on to describe data. Even though there is an American fascination with the DK crush technique, if you look at the data, it's actually weak for DK crush. And let's go by the major trials of left main. You have the Excel trial that put left main stenting on the map as an alternative to cabbage. And in Excel trial for provisional stenting, T and TAP were the biggest techniques, nearly 80%. And even in plant to stand strategy, T or TAP were applied in 50% of the cases, then you had culotte in 23%. Crush was a minority, 14%. And in EBC main trial, which compared a provisional to two stand strategy, in the plant to stand, they used culotte in 53% of the time and T or TAP 33% of the time. DK crush was only used in 5% of the cases. And this is the big noble trial. Again, stent versus cabbage, a major trial like Excel. And in that trial, 87% were distal left main, yet two stent strategy was only used in 35%. Again, arguing in favor of provisional stenting in most distal left main. And the two stent strategies that were used were culotte first, and T stand second, crush was the least use. So again, in both Noble and XL, crush was the least used strategy. Only DK crush five supports the use of DK crush in complex distal left main. And in DK crush five, DK crush was compared to provisional in complex distal left main and showed that DK crush was better in terms of stent failure, and target vessel MI. But if anything, the DK crush five suggests that in complex distal left main that I explained, two stent strategy is superior to provisional strategy. It doesn't establish that DK crush is superior to other two stenting strategy. There is only one study that compared two different two stent strategy. The DK crush three compared DK crush with culotte in distal left main. And in that trial, DK crush was superior to culotte with less TVR at one year, significantly less, and even more so at three years with less target vessel MI and less stent thrombosis. But it is speculated that the DK crush five operator, which are mainly from one country, uh, used suboptimal culotte technique, no pot and too much metal overlap instead of mini culotte, which made the culotte result look a lot worse than the European culotte results. And more importantly than the actual two stent strategy that you use in a provisional and in upfront two stent, the most important thing is rather proper vessel preparation and stent post dilatation, especially at the ostia of LAD and left circumflex. This is what improves outcomes rather than particular two stent strategy, rather than DK crush is better than T or culotte. This is what improves outcomes, particularly that the ostium of the left circumflex is the Achilles heel of left main stenting. It's the site where you get the most restenosis, target vessel revascularization, and where you get the most severe and refractory under expansion when you do two stents. So it's extremely important to prepare the vessel properly. And these are five ideas. One, you need high pressure predilatation or rotablation or lithotripsy of the left circumflex osseum and or LAD. Two, you need to do pot proximal optimization after each main branch stenting before you rewire. And after side branch stenting, you need to always pull back the balloon and post dilate the osseum at high pressure. So side branch stenting is always two step. You deploy the side branch, then you, you immediately pull back and inflate it at high pressure over 18 atmosphere in all technique, including the DK crush technique before you eventually crush that side branch. You post dilated high pressure before you crush it. Another idea 
when we do the kiss, always do sequential kiss, not just simultaneous kiss. So you double balloon, you inflate the balloon in each branch, the side branch and the main branch at over 18 atmosphere sequentially, then you do your simultaneous kiss at eight to 12 atmosphere. And always you have that sequence throughout your procedure, whatever technique you use. You do part of the proximal extension of the stent into the main branch, then you rewire and kiss, then you repart afterwards. So part, rewire, kiss, repart. I will describe those tap and T stents, which I believe are the better technique, particularly in distal left main. And they are the simpler techniques and the better tolerated hemodynamically. And they are also the techniques that lead to least metal overlap. And they are the techniques that have been most used in Excel landmark trial. So tap in distal left main consists of placing a stent from your left main to the LED crossover stent. Then you rewire once and you deploy your left circumflex stent while you have a balloon station into the left main. Then you inflate simultaneously the left circumflex and the left main balloon. So really your left circumflex stent Deployment is seamlessly followed by kissing balloon dilatation without the need for rewiring. For both tap stenting and final kissing balloon, you use the same rewiring that you have already done for side branch post dilatation. And you will end up with a small neocarina of metal inside the left main. That's the only downside of tap. And tap is only done after you've deployed the main vessel stent, in this case, crossover left main to LAD. So I'll give you more details. So you start, you deploy that stent left main to LAD, then you do pot in the left main, then you rewire the left circumflex. It's easy rewiring through one stent layer. Then you balloon it, then you deploy the tap stent while you have a balloon station in the main branch, then you pull back the tap stand balloon and you post dilate that ostium of the left circumflex. Like I said, always, whenever you deploy a side branch stand, you deploy it, then you pull back the balloon and do high pressure dilatation of that side branch. Then you do simultaneous kissing balloon dilatation with the main branch balloon that was waiting. Importantly, unlike the common misconception in the US, tap can be used in shallow angle, like 30 degree angle if you use a proper technique. It does not have to be over 70 degree. It's easier if it is over 70 degrees, but it absolutely doesn't have to be. And I've done it in shallow angles and I'll show you the, the proper tips for that. And this is an illustration of the tap steps. Use stent boost very importantly to position the tap stent. So you deploy your main vessel stent, then you pot the proximal main vessel, then you rewire and position your tap stent. And that side branch tap stent, the dot, should be just inside the main branch, not touching or barely touching the main branch wire balloon without missing the ostium. So it's barely inside the main branch. Then you deploy it, then you pull back the balloon and do high pressure inflation of that ostium. Then you pull back the main vessel balloon and do kissing balloon dilatation. Then it preferably you should do final pot. It is recommended to do final pot, but I worry if the pot balloon in the main branch extends a little bit to the carina, it will end up crushing the tap stent. And it's no longer tap, it becomes like a crush technique. So it is key to use stent boost to position that pot balloon just before the carina 
and before the origin of the tap stand. And it's nice if your lab has short six millimeters balloon for pot. This slide shows you that tap may be applicable for angles that aren't close to 90 degrees. This here is about 30 degrees. You can also do inverted tap, where you start your stent from left main to left circumflex, and then you do the tap stent in the LED. This inverted tap is done if the left circumflex disease is critical, while the LED disease is moderate and it's easy to wire, in which case you may just stent left main to left circumflex and do provisional balloon and provisional tap stenting of the LED. Or you may be planning to do upfront two stent strategy, but even if you're doing upfront two stent strategy, you're starting with the left main left circumflex, then you put your tap LED stent afterward. The second condition where inverted tap may be preferred is when the left circumflex caliber better matches the left main caliber than the LED caliber does, meaning you have a big left circumflex that is almost the size of the left main, whereas the LED is small. Again, the tap stent can only be deployed after your main branch stent has been deployed. And this is a video animation by Dr. Stankovic uh, that I obtained from a PCR webinar in 2020. It illustrates the provisional steps nicely and it shows you how to do the tap technique. So here you're doing your main branch stent, then your pot, then you rewire the side branch, you do balloon dilatation and kissing balloon, then you advance and properly position your tap stent, then you pull the balloon of that tap stent, do high pressure inflation, then you inflate that balloon in the main branch that was stationed. Watch it again. Tap stand position deployed while a balloon is waiting here. You post dilate the tap stand, then you do a kissing balloon. Then you do a final pot. And see here the small piece of tap protruding in the main vessel, but it should only be small. And note how the kissing balloon dilatation positions the carina in the center, allowing normal flow in both direction. That's the role of the kissing balloon, to center that carina and provide normal flow both ways. And it will allow you to advance distal devices is needed without hindrance. This slide shows you the difference in side branch strut overhang between tap, crush, and culotte. Tap leaves a small neocarina, a piece of metal hanging in the middle of the main branch. Crush, on the other hand, the side branch is smashed to the wall and there is no neocarina in the lumen. That side branch stent is crushed to the wall, whether before main branch stenting, as in standard SK single kiss or double kiss crush, or it may be smashed to the wall after main branch stenting, as in reverse crush. In culotte, the side branch stent goes all the way to the opposite main branch wall and touches that opposite wall. The full circumference of the side branch is overlapped with the full circumference of the main branch stent, and you get two full circumferential layers of stent against the main branch wall. Keep that culotte overlap as short as possible. Tap is very different from what I call the perfect T. In perfect T, you're deploying your side branch left circumflex stent before you've deployed your main vessel stent. In this case, the angle must be close to 90 degree, unlike tap which can be applied to any angle. In perfect T, you have to be close to 90 degree. You position it perfectly and you have a balloon stationed in the main vessel. After you deploy your circumflex stent, you balloon the main vessel to crush any potential 
protrusion, then you deploy your main vessel stent. So you're starting with a side branch, then you put the main branch stent. After that, you have to pot the main branch as usual. Then you have to rewire, but it's an easy rewiring across one stent layer because that osteum only has one stent layer, the main vessel stent layer. So you rewire, then you do a kissing balloon. Then ideally you repot. So again, perfect T is different from tap and actually sequentially the steps are very close to the single kiss nano crush. And perfect T is actually almost a nano crush. In nano crush, the angle is not perfectly 90 degree. So when you position your T stent in the circumflex, in order to fully cover the osseum, a piece of that stent will hang into the main vessel. So if the perfect T hangs a tiny bit into the main vessel, you end up having less than one millimeter nano crush, but it is almost impossible to distinguish a perfect T from a nano crush as it's only 0.5 to one millimeter difference in how far the stent extends into the main branch. So practically, I consider them the same. And in that case, the side branch stent may have a tiny piece, by definition, less than one millimeter piece that is hanging in the main vessel and that gets crushed by the main vessel balloon, then the main vessel stent. Then after main vessel stenting, you rewire and you do simultaneous kiss. Nano crush is more similar to the perfect T than to standard crush because you have very little crushed area, which is almost like having no crushed area. Most of the side branch osteum is only covered by struts of the main vessel stent, the red one, with a tiny area of double layers of stent toward the carina. This is different from the three layers of stent you get with a standard crush on the upper arm and two layers toward the carina. You see here three layers and two layers here in the standard whether single kiss or double kiss crush. But in terms of rewiring and doing eventually simultaneous kissing balloons, nano crush and perfect T are closer in steps to the standard SK crush than to the tap. And these are summary key ideas for perfect T and for tap. For perfect T, you need 90 degree angle, but it's okay for over 60 to 70 degree angle as it will end up being a nano crush. And you start by T stent in the side branch before you do your main branch stenting, then you stent main branch. You may even do standalone T stent in isolated osteal left circumflex disease. Now for tap, you can only deploy the tap stent after main branch stenting. It can be applied for shallow side branch angle like 30 degree as long as you do good pot to make the main branch large, you recross the distal strut, you use a stent boost technology, and the fourth idea, it's even more successful at shallow angle if your side branch is significantly smaller than main branch. So the relative amount of overhang will be small. And tap may also be done for angles close to 90 degree instead of a perfect T if you have already deployed your main branch stand. If you've already deployed your main branch stand and your angle is close to 90 degree, you can still do tap. You may not end up with much protrusion at all, but the sequence of treatment is like a tap where you recross, deploy your stent and do simultaneous balloon, stent balloon inflation. And this is an illustration of the key concept to allow you to do tap successfully in all cases, particularly in shallow angles. After main vessel stenting, you have to do a good pot to create a good bulge of the proximal main vessel stent into the side branch. 
And then when you rewire into the side branch, you have to rewire crossing the distal stent struts. That's very important. When you cross distally, then balloon the side branch, you push those main branch struts toward the upper arm of the side branch, as in here, which creates good scaffolding of the upper, the top arm of the side branch with your main branch stent. And the upper arm is actually the one that is more difficult to cover with your tap stent. So when you create a scaffolding already before you put your tap stent, it's easier to position your tap stent with a lot less protrusion. Conversely, if you cross proximally, you're not going to create a scaffolding of that upper arm of the side branch. And when you position your tap stent in order to cover that upper arm, you have to make it protrude furthermore. So proximal crossing, more protrusion. Distal crossing, more scaffolding of that upper arm of side branch and easier positioning without protrusion. This ends up being tap with minimal protrusion. The so-called actually T stent. It's not the perfect T, but the in the EBC European Bifurcation Club, they call that tap with minimal protrusion or practically no protrusion, they call it T stent. I prefer to reserve the T stent terminology for that perfect T that you position before main vessel stenting. And in order to cross the distal stent struts, it's not very difficult. Make your wire tip bend larger than the side branch and go distally with your wire, then pull back. That's how you end up crossing distally. And you can verify the distal strut crossing and the amount of metal overhang using a stent boost, as in here. This was distal strut rewiring and minimal overhang by stent boost. Again, tap is applied here to a shallow angle, 30 degrees. And here is the EBC where they call tap with minimal protrusion T stent versus the tap with more protrusion. And for the same side branch and the same bifurcation, you can do a less perfect tap as in here versus a more perfect tap with no stent protrusion. The difference is how you cross distally versus proximally and how good your pot is. Another note, when you have tap with some protrusion, you may have difficulty advancing devices in the main branch distal to that neocarina, especially stent. As you're trying to advance stent somewhere distally in the vessel in the future, your stent may have a friction around that neocarina and may have difficulty advancement. However, if you cannot advance a balloon past that neocarina, it means you may be going through the neocarina stent struts. So in this case, you need to rewire your main vessel. And you can keep that first wire over which you could not advance a balloon, keep it and advance the second wire. That first wire may serve to deflect away the second wire from the neocarina. You may even keep the first balloon hanging around here and rewire and advance another balloon. That first wire balloon will deflect you away from the neocarina. This is an illustration from a case I did. It was LED diagonal tap. This is a tap in the diagonal and the angle is very shallow here, is less than 30 degree. But with a stand boost and with rewiring the side branch across distal struts, I had very little ne neocarina in the main vessel. See here how pot was well done and distal recrossing created a scaffolding into that side branch. We deploy the top stent here while a balloon is positioned in the main branch to prevent the top stent from touching the wall and becoming a culotte. Then after we deploy that side branch stent, we pull its balloon, we inflate it at high pressure, 
then we do simultaneous kissing balloon of the main branch, side branch, leaving potentially a little neocarina. This was an excellent result. We had excellent side branch coverage. We did not miss the ostium of the side branch, yet we had minimal stent overlap and practically no overhang. Keep in mind how much stent and metal overlap you get with culotte and crush. Look how much with culotte you get, how much with crush. We got here practically no stent overlap, much less metal probably translate into less restenosis by all data we know, not directly in bifurcation, but overall in instant restenosis data. And this is a summary of the advantages of T and TAP compared to DK crash and culotte. You only require side branch once after stenting versus two times with DK crash and with culotte. You only do one kissing balloon. And in case of TAP, you're using the top stent balloon itself for your kissing balloon versus needing two kissing balloon inflation with DK crush and one or preferably two with culotte, the so-called DK culotte. And another advantage you require through only one stent layer versus two layers with culotte and two to three layers with DK crush. With culotte, after deploying your second stand, the blue, you have to rewire into this stand potentially through two stand layers. One note here, I described that with provisional stenting in general and with tap, you need to recross the distal stent struts across the side branch to obtain good scaffolding of the upper arm of the side branch and easily position the tap stand. In crush, however, when you rewire the crushed stent, it's best to cross proximally or mid stent layers, not distally. You want to avoid the distal stent layers. Why? Because in crush, you already have side branch stent covering the upper arm of the side branch with actually most metal in that area. You have two layers of stent in that upper arm of the side branch and even three layers after you position your main vessel stent. So this upper arm in crush actually has a lot of stent layers. So rewiring distally and ballooning will push more stent struts over that crushed area that already has too much stent causing too much metal overlap. It can also cause the wire to go too distally in the gap between the carina and the side branch stent struts and cause malaposition upon inflation. Regarding culotte, like in provisional and in tap, you cross distally. You don't want to recross the stent layers proximally because this will push too much metal toward the carina when you do your kissing balloon. You'll end up with something like this, too much metal pushed toward that carina, which is what you call neocarina, compared to how it should be if you cross proximally. And I mentioned the importance of vessel preparation and proper stenting technique more importantly than the actual technique you choose. The worst thing you can do is do DK crush with an underexpanded left circumflex stent. You end up with three metal layers at the left circumflex osseum with an underexpansion. Most stent failure at the carina are not instant tissue growth. They are rather stent underexpansion, especially at the ostia and at that carina. And the problem is exaggerated if you're doing DK crush or culotte with multiple layers of underexpanded stents. And you should always verify in this cell left main bifurcation stenting proper stent expansion with imaging. These are MSA dimension from a Korean paper that indicated for your left main, the main left main should be at least eight millimeter square, the carina seven millimeter square, ostial LED six and ostial circumflex five, that eight, seven, six, five rules. And those were used in the Renovate imaging trial. 
However, in addition to that, I believe it's important to have proper relative stent expansion, over 90% stent expansion in the LED compared to the distal LED reference lumen area and the left main compared to the reference left main luminal area. Also, those numbers may be too small for the general European and American population. In fact, in Noble Ivis analysis, the best result were with MSA over 13 for the left main or at least over 10 millimeters square. So shoot for those absolute values and preferably a little higher, particularly in European American population and aim also for relative stent expansion more than 90% of the reference. Aside from IVIS, another general sizing idea is that in general, the proximal LED is about 3.5 millimeters. The proximal left circumflex is about three to 3.5 millimeters. And the left main, which based on the fractal law is two thirds of the summation of the LED plus left circumflex is usually around 4.5 to five millimeters. Now regarding sheath size and radial versus femoral axis, I often use a radial axis for left main interventions. Six French is often okay, but if the radial artery is large, it is easier to use seven French and I prefer seven French as possible. It's easier to fit simultaneous stent balloon in seven French than six French. In TAP and in nano crush and in SK or DK crush, you need at one point to position simultaneously a stent and a balloon. Six French can fit simultaneous stent balloon as long as both the stent and the balloon are three millimeter or less. Six French can also fit a stent that is a 3.5 millimeter with a short balloon that is a three millimeter, but it is tight, the space. So consider seven French radial if radial size allows, but you can use six French if you use those sizes. LV support is rarely needed in left main intervention, unlike what fellows think. LV support was used in 5% of patients in XL left main trial, 3% in provisional and 10% in the plan to stand strategy. If support is needed, you can still use radial access for your left main intervention, I would use radial for the left main, typically, if I can, seven French radial, and I would use femoral axis for the support. Or in patients who are relatively short, you can use single axis femoral impella, and through that 14 French impella sheath, you put your guiding catheter. Now, how do you decide if LV support is needed? Review my prior talk regarding LV support. And the decision is based on two major factors and six other factors. The two major factors being hemodynamics and the complexity of your PCI. Both those factors are modifiable. You can simplify the complexity of your PCI by using a simpler bifurcation technique, provisional and TAP or perfect T. And you can improve the hemodynamic by diuresing the patients before the complex procedure. And these are slides from EBC main and DK crush five. In both radial axis was used in 70 plus percent of the cases and six French guiding catheter was used in 53 to 61%, whereas seven French was used in less than 50% of the cases.